Dennis Report is in-depth media for New Brunswick. We are supported by viewers just like you. If you'd like to support the show, go to thedennisreport.ca and click on PayPal or Patreon. Today's guest is David Coon, Green Party leader in New Brunswick and MLA for Fredericton South. Thanks, David. My pleasure. So today's headlines all about uh, up in Beldoon, um, the iron ore smelter. Um, you've just come from doing an information morning, um, that political panel thing. Um, a lot of times there's not a chance to go a bit deeper into some of the specifics that go in behind the scenes on a deal like this. So you've got free reign to say the stuff that needs to be out there so that people know um, the merits or the demerits of a program like this. Well, I think you've got to set it in context. For, for years and years, government has ignored the North. When the mill shut down on Dalhousie, which was devastating for people there, did anything happen? No. Uh, you know, when they shut down the uh, power plant in Dalhousie, did anything happen? No. And uh, with the, the smelter going down, is anything happening? Hard to see. But what should have happened or what needs to happen, uh, and certainly what I would make happen, is to work with people in the area to put in place a, a, a regional development strategy that builds on the strengths they've got there, builds on the assets they've got there, builds on the people they've got there, uh, that's for the long term that's going to provide some kind of sustainability for the communities along the North Shore. That's what we need. Um, you know, our experience with, with these one-off proposals has not been very positive in the past in New Brunswick. Uh, a company sees an opportunity, an, an area that's uh, desperate, and a government that's uh, willing to hand out money and uh, show up with uh, their proposals and we've seen it before we saw Bennett Environmental wanting to import uh, hazardous waste from New Jersey and, and burn it up in uh, Baldoon I mean uh, so here we are um, in, the, in, in, in a climate crisis with a company that is uh, coming and saying we're gonna burn more coal that's not acceptable anymore you, everyone knows this hmm. you know in the face of the climate crisis we can't we we've, we've we've blown through the limits to to growth based on burning and consuming more coal and other fossil fuels that's done uh we've got to develop in ways that use less or at least have no net impact on on our consumption mm -hmm. in the spin of that ar argument in today's news story um, was also the notion of global emissions and that somehow you're supposed to integrate the full footprint of where the ore came from and where it's potentially going to go after it's been um, manufactured, which means China. Um, and your comment was, you know, and that's what they gave you the, the headline for. It's like it's ridiculous or it's nonsensical. You make an interesting move, though, because you say, let's apply that to everything. Um, if I've got that right. So, so if we look at where food comes from or where our cars come from, uh, take your pick. Um, and at some point, someone has to make the move to recognize local rather than global. Right. So, exactly. So, you know, emissions are created for manufacturing a lot of the products we consume um, that are made in China. And those emissions are not assigned to us. When we export... Uh, when Irving Oil exports refined petroleum products, whether it's jet fuel or, or uh, diesel or whatever it is, to Boston and the U.S. Northeast, uh, the emissions for using that, burning that, are not assigned to us. They they go there. So you know it's it, it, it's it's not the way you know this is pursued. You need to have a ledger that gives you the 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 uh, the, the pluses and the minuses to sort it all out. Uh, which would be a bit of a nightmare. We, and around the world, organize uh, in response to the climate crisis by setting targets um, and getting our emissions down uh, based on those targets within political jurisdictions, provinces, states, and countries. And uh, ultimately, we've got to get off fossil fuels in the next 30 years, and uh, this is sending us in the wrong direction. We're on the cusp of a transition, if we want to do it. You talked about a local community doing a, a map or an inventory of its assets and deciding for itself to a degree what it needs to do in order to become economically viable again. Um, 
an old interview with Carlos Gomez four or five years ago. He was the point person for a federal government project that was in northern New Brunswick on community self-determination for economic drivers. It was a huge success, and then it got shelved. Um, somewhere else, I think it was Dauphin, Manitoba, we're doing a guaranteed annual income experiment, and those two things are happening in the 70s. Now, there's all kinds of literature that shows and studies that show that this model works. Given New Brunswick scale, it looks like this should work. The cusp of the change is, can we integrate that model and let go of the model that we've been working with the past 40 or 50 years of take the big company, give them lots of subsidies, plunk them in a rural area, and hope it's viable for the long term? Well, we have to, because that approach has clearly not worked in the past. Uh, so we need to do something differently. We need to think about real, legitimate community development where the provincial government is there as a partner to support um, the communities in pursuing uh, community development, economic development locally, um, to provide them with the, the tools and the capacity to do that and, and, uh, and capital, um, access to capital for getting things off the ground. Um, that's what we need. There's, I mean, not, there's lots of great ideas. There's some good initiatives underway up north, um, but uh, you know, governments after government have treated the north as second-class citizens, so those things don't get the support. The first net zero home, first net zero energy home built in New Brunswick was built in Bathurst. Hmm. Now, why did that not become? And there's probably lots of reasons, but as an example, become kind of the epicenter for designing and 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 uh, and building net zero energy homes. Uh, throughout the Maritimes. And they did, the first one was there. Yep. Um, so, you know, we, we, there are all kinds of possibilities there if you only, if, 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 if we had a, a government that had the vision to take the ideas that people are generating locally and, and enable them, be enablers to help them run with them. Um, and that's what we need. Uh, and uh, that's what we haven't got. An outsider looking in would think, um, here's these hundreds of millions that tend to go to traditional industries. What if that money was handed over to communities to support the drivers that you're talking about? You think that would ever happen? Well, I think if, if we take, if we, if we look at development as necessarily being community driven, supported by government in terms of providing capacity and tools and mm -hmm. all of that, uh, then it can, but you have to have that um, framework. If, if, if as a government you do what I would want to do, and that is, is put uh, the well-being of our people and our communities at the center of everything government does, then that kind of approach to development naturally flows from that um, stand. I say we put people in communities at the center of everything we do as a government, then those are the kinds of approaches to development that are, that will occur. They, they fit so nicely, and then you start looking at okay, what are the assets? You know, what can you do with with uh, with the the forests in the area? Uh, well, first of all, they're all locked up, so you can't do anything with them. Different than's happening now, so you need to unlock them and look at the community forestry, for example, mm -hmm. and then look at you know uh, down the down the line what you can do with the different uh, uh, sorts of wood in terms of products and so on and uh, the kinds of proposals that uh, people locally would bring forward, just as as one example, you've got waste, you've got waste from uh, um, processing both on the wood side and the seafood side a little further out, but it's not too far away. Um, there's a great raw material for manufacturing biogas, uh, renewable natural gas, um, to uh, to provide local energy for people um, and businesses. So you know the the. The uh, mayor of Campbellton um, tried to pitch uh, renewable energy development to um, NB Power, and under the regime that uh, this government has been operating under, the former government was operating under, they just said no. Just no. So, you know, the, not only would that create opportunities locally, uh, economically, but it was going to save the city of uh, Campbellton a lot of money because they were going to have electricity at six cents a kilowatt hour or so rather than what they're paying now from mb power directly so you know the doors get shut and uh so a different approach does need to be taken and that's what i would do does a four-way minority government in the legislature start to loosen up that control mechanism because this news story 
In almost all the news stories in the previous 40 years, we'll link job creation with government, which in a way is a mystery because it's not the government's job or to create jobs. <laughs> it's the government's jobs to facilitate a culture or an environment that would help that grow. But it's not, um, here's $300 million and there's so many jobs for four years. It's, yeah. it's devolved to that. There's an autonomy or a self-empowerment issue that's missing for communities that you just spoke to. And then there's this general narrative or culture that we've always done it this way. And it's the lockstep with the two parties. And then we've had 18 months, 20 months of a four-way conversation. Can we possibly be at the front end of shifting how we nurture this province for government to be empowering and protecting people rather than empowering and protecting business? Well, I think not not in the current way things have been operating at, at the Legislative Assembly, that's for sure. Um, if we had proportional representation, hmm. um, that would force a change in the political culture. So co cooperation, collaboration would be a natural expectation for every government. Okay. Then it could. And, and the model I, I like to use to illustrate this is New Zealand. Mm -hmm. You know, New Zealand, is, I'm so impressed what is happening in New Zealand. Um, they went to proportional representation just in the 90s. And they had our system before that. And they said, the government of the day said, if it doesn't work, um, we're going to have a referendum uh, one way or the other, and you can and you can decide. After we've tried it out, two elections, then everyone's going to vote and say, do you want to keep it or, or go back the way we were? People voted massively to keep it. And, uh, and, and now you have, for example, a, a collaborative government that has set... Um, uh, uh, their last budget, the government's last budget, is one focused on on the well-being of the of the population of New Zealand, mm. and they created criteria yeah. um, around that and uh, put in place uh, f uh, budget lines and then programming from that that and policies from that that actually are making a difference uh, in the in the country to increasing equality and and uh, tackling mental health and a whole raft of issues that uh, were holding people and communities back. So, so in your view, then, proportional representation would be a better solution than what we've had, because it's the first time in uh, 100 years we have a four-way minority government, and um, sometimes it just takes some patience for everybody to figure out how to do this dance with the four-way conversation, but from your point of view, because you're deep in the middle of it, that... There's no different leverage points for you that you didn't have, you know, two years ago. There are some. There are some in a limited way, but um, but uh, the, the 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 our system hasn't changed, and so what you have is the official opposition assuming that they're just biding their time uh, until the election comes, and and they will then replace the conservative government, and uh, so there is no. Uh, interest on the government on the opposition official opposition side to actually see anything happen as far as I can tell um, the up until recently the government itself was uh, determined to operate like a majority government um, so the very first bill they brought forward at the committee stage where you can make amendments to improve the bill I made a series of amendments uh, that clearly were going to receive support of the majority of the members in the house in the committee and uh, the government withdrew the bill rather than seeing it amended in any way, whatever the merits of the amendments were. So it's still caught so, in that the greater good versus political advantage. So they withdrew the bill. But there's been a shift in the last little while, which is fascinating to me, interesting. And I guess it's got to be coming from the top, uh, where, where uh, recently we made some amendments, I made some amendments, uh, uh, proposed amendments for the Climate Change Act to set up the, the way they were setting up the the industrial regulations they want to bring in for industry on uh, on carbon pollution, and uh, they agreed to them. I mean, they had the audit, the uh, solicitor, the um, uh, attorney general's office uh, redo them a bit so they actually work better in the in the legislation, which is an improvement. Mm -hmm. uh, but substantively, they're the same, and this is great. So this is this is what should be happening. Mm. Um, you know, similarly on, uh, on, it was too late for the nursing homes, that nursing home workers, that was terrible. But with, when the government was bringing, uh, has brought legislation to do something similar uh, to police and firefighters to, 
change the nature of binding arbitration, which which they received in return for uh, giving up the right to strike in that case. And that was negotiated around a table. Municipal mm -hmm. representatives, police and fire representatives some years ago. Mm -hmm. We'll give up our right to strike in return for uh, the ability to go to binding arbitration. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now the municipalities are um, unhappy with how that's working. Um, so they convinced the premier to bring a bill forward to uh, make the change. And I said to him, I can't support that. I think what should happen is you don't want to, there's no rationale here to hit the police and firefighters over the head with a hammer on this. The, the round table should be reconstituted that they first negotiated this arrangement, that is the municipalities and the police and fire uh, unions, and work it out or try to work it out. Mm -hmm. And will you give them three months? Mm -hmm. And he said yes. And so the, the bill he wanted, he pre presented is, is on ice for three months. Um, they're supposed to be recon they're supposed to have reconstituted the municipal um, firefighter police committee. Um, but I don't know um, what's going on because I, I got a call the other day from uh, Victor Boudreau, who had been hired by the Cities Association to go to meet for the mayor's come meet with me about uh, about this very issue. And um, and I, I had met with quite a number of them who who raised this issue in the past with me, and I said the very same thing to them. This was before this happened. I said to the very the very said same thing to them i said in my opinion mr mayor or madam mayor what should happen is uh, you've got issues with the arrangement now okay go back recreate the table put them on the table and try and work it out mm -hmm. that's how this came about in the first place you need to go back and do that i am opposed to simply creating a piece of legislation and hit the police and firefighters over the head with that go back to the table try and work it out and then come back and tell us what happens mm -hmm. um but it doesn't seem to me that that really, I don't know, I'm going to ask them tonight, uh, today, because I'm meeting them today. But, um, you know, right afterwards, the mayor of St. John was quite angry, and he's in the media, and he said, you know, this is ridiculous, and uh, we're certainly not going to, he's not going to participate or whatever. So, so to, to me, that's just good sense, right? It's good sense. You know, it's like, I give up something to you in return for something else that's going to work for for both of us, yep. and the only way you can achieve that is if you sit down and it's not working. It's not and working. You work something you know, it's turned out that it's not working quite the way you thought it was going to work. Yeah, we need to get back together and sort it out, and see what we can come up with, rather than rather than just have, go to the province and say, please impose a a, a, a change to the yep. law on those people, on those police and firefighters. Uh, what is that? Yep. This might be an out of context question, but I'm just curious. Um, the Equal Opportunities Act in 66 shifted an awful lot of authority into the legislature that maybe now municipalities could be taking things over on their own a bit more. Um, I don't have some specifics, but, but just that general principle that was put in place in 66 might have run its course by 2020. Are there some things that need to change that would give municipalities a chance to run at the speed they want to run, which would then tie to your community, uh, local economic drivers kind of exercise? I think so, yes. Um, um, they do. Um, and certainly as Greens, you know, we're very much in support for putting decision-making as close to people as possible, mm -hmm. making sure the authority, as much authority as, 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 uh, as make, is practical to be vested as close to the people um, who are affected by the decisions. Um, but, you know, it, it requires some kind of um, perhaps improvement in municipal governance legislation. To, so here's an example um, on, on homelessness. We should give the authority to the municipalities to require developers to have a certain percentage of their units uh, available in new buildings as affordable apartments. Municipalities don't have that authority now. We should give it to the province, should give it to them. Provincial legislation should be changed so that well, the legislature should give it to them. Um, however, they do have the authority under the existing laws to say to a developer, if, it's, if the developer is seeking a variance 
I want to build my building a story higher or I want a parking lot 50% bigger or something that is, you know, variance from what's, what's allowed. Uh, when that happens, currently they have the, I think municipalities have the authority to say, okay, we will do that, but in return you must pr provide a certain percentage of your units as affordable. They've never taken, it's in Fredericton. I don't know about the others, but Fredericton has never taken the advantage of that. Yeah, that, that was reported uh, a couple of weeks ago when Mayor Mike O'Brien was saying, well, there's nothing we can do about this. And right. you were quick to point out, but you do have these opportunities. Or right. So so it's important um, to ensure that we've got uh, um, as democratic and accountable local governance as possible mm -hmm. so that so that uh, authority is exercised when it's available mm. in the public interest, mm. uh, right? In the public interest, because municipal governments are fa face similar, you know, some similar pressure, I guess, that the provincial governments do, and that is, you know, developers are wanting to do this, and and uh, and they might say, well, you know, if if I have to provide some affordable apartments, I may reconsider building the building or whatever it is. It's mm. the same old story, so. Uh, uh, then it becomes a question, well, in whose interest are you governing? Are you governing in the public interest to improve the well-being of the citizens of the city mm -hmm. uh, or not? And so so you see what I'm saying. I think that part and parcel with more authority is another another look at um, the Local Governance Act to uh, ensure that local governments are as accountable to uh, it's their citizens and that citizens are necessarily engaged directly um, in, in, in very um, participatory ways, because you can do it at the municipal level. That's the exciting thing. Yes. We've seen it in Fredericton with the, um, um, what are they called? The, you know, the things you were involved with, with the- um, oh, Great gatherings? Great gatherings, the great yes. gatherings. There's a good, ex you, could, you could actually create something like great gatherings uh, as a real participatory way to engage people in decision making yep. um, that municipal governments make because you're operating at a scale where that actually is possible. Yep. And yep. so you have could have a far more democratic decision making process, uh, but it would have to be provided for in legislation. So so I think it's it's kind of exciting to think about, you know, increasing the authority while increasing the sort of d democracy at the local level. Yep. And those great gatherings actually were originally designed to create strategic outcomes. Right. They yeah. weren't just information sharing yeah. and, and a bit of community building. It was because the only way you will achieve those outcomes is if everybody who has a relation to it or a connection to it are in the room together. Because yeah. each of them has a piece of that puzzle. Much like you talking about police forces and fire departments sitting down with municipal governance to say we should be working this out. And it's brilliant. And the, the difference, the only difference would be if we... If we beefed up the, the provincial legislation on local governance, um, it could then uh, create an obligation on, on municipalities to more closely integrate municipal governments to more closely integrate with that kind of um, uh, uh, citizen engagement to then act on yes. what what is decided. Well, your buy-in level is so huge. So yeah. you actually create a uh, a buy-in within the legislation or a mechanism for buy-in with the legislation or, or for 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 commitment to move things forward. Um, anyway, I mean, uh, to me, it, it opens up all kinds of exciting possibilities. Yep. Which, to work back a little bit, though, about community design and community autonomy to a degree and um, a smooth meshing between levels of government and citizens. But if Fredericton is an example, but St. John and Moncton, the Upper Riverview, could it be equal examples? Construction and development continues to go on, and it's working within a certain framework, but somewhere it's still missing the thought process for 2040 or 2050. Yeah. Buildings still seem to be designed based on 2010 or 2000. Yeah. So there's no roof gardens yet. There's no solar panel units yet. There's no notion of uh, energy efficiency. Um, there's no notion of water displacement. I mean, I'm sure there's rules for each of these things in there. And recycling, of course, is the biggest one. Fredericton is the example with multi-unit buildings going up left, right, and center. They had a record year for uh, yeah. uh, building permits last year. But the city will go, well, we don't have the authority to tell them to do that. And I want to play two things. I want to go, oh, maybe the legal authority, but what about the moral authority? What about this is the kind, kind of community we're trying to build here? Right. So if you want to build here, yeah, we can't legally oblige you to do that. But morally, we think it's a good thing to do because these are our values. Yeah, I mean, yes, that requires some vision and a clear articulation of, of that vision in terms of where you want to go and what that looks like. But also the 
do have ways of, of creating compliance uh, through building codes. So a city could decide we are going to apply uh, the, the latest uh, commercial uh, energy code, which, is, which has a, put, places a high emphasis on energy efficiency, for example, for new construction of commercial buildings in this uh, city. Uh, and so, so cities could do that. Mm -hmm. um, right now, it's it's just it's the minimum code you meet. But but they could apply that. So okay, the, nationally, there's a, a commercial code that's been created uh, specifically to get high energy efficiency buildings built. We, we're going to apply that, and so you're going to you're going to have to meet it. They, cities could do that. And and it also would generate uh, the byproduct or the related businesses that would support that type of construction. Yeah. Um, um, Three years ago, Navco Power was on here talking about how to make your building more efficient and actually yeah. generate a little bit of, of your own energy to reduce your, your footprint. And I think where there's social benefit to that, it, it behooves government, uh, provincial governments to, to come up with um, innovative uh, uh, financing mechanisms to uh, help it deal with uh, any additional capital cost. Um, so you can make the case that, you know, that the payback is going to be whatever it is pretty, you know, not too long, you know, it's, it's, it's in a reasonable number of years, but the, the hurdle is the extra additional capital cost. Mm -hmm. Um, and if that additional capital cost, uh, despite, despite the, the economics of it being very good, mm -hmm. uh, if that's a hindrance to going forward, let's have financing mechanisms to help overcome that initial capital cost, which you pay back, but, uh, you know, pay back through your energy savings on the building. Um, maybe you pay back through your property tax. There's all, all, it's fascinating when you look at what um, uh, different jurisdictions are doing to provide greater access to capital for this kind of development to um, basically smooth out the bump uh, of the initial upfront capital because the benefits uh, not only economically are there, but of course socially and environmentally. In the course of all the conversations in the legislature, um, not so much with the Green Party, because I suspect the answer, uh, that I already know the answer to it, but within the legislature, that tougher grind of all the different perspectives. Is there ever, in your experience, been a moment where there's a shared vision for the province? Because sometimes a lot of our, our disconnect happens because there's too many competing visions for it. Uh, we should be doing the industrial-based model and subsidizing industry in order to create jobs to drive the economy. There's the other narrative, we need to grow the economy, thinking that things are infinite rather than it's an interconnected system and you actually redistribute the economy and never really grow anything. Um, but is there ever a moment that goes click and went, oh, this is who we are and this is the direction we should move? And if there isn't a click, can you play with what that, that shared vision should be like? I think... Um so no there isn't because um for for us for example as greens like i, I said we put uh, and as government we would put the well-being of people and communities uh at the center of everything we do um particularly the most vulnerable in, in our children it's future um the current government the premier let's say specifically uh the center of what everything he does is really based on um, uh, debt reduction and delivering budget surpluses. And so that has all kinds of implications if that's your driving force. The previous government, um, a little harder to figure out, but, but certainly the rhetoric was to grow the GDP was the kind of their central focus. Um, and and if, if you're singularly focused on that, that has other consequences too, and a lot of other things get neglected. So, yes. so that, so the, the 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 overwhelming feeling that so many people have about our healthcare system is a mess, and and what are we, in social development, what there's no for affordable housing, what's everywhere we look, it seems like there's massive problems, and it's overwhelming. Part of that is because of uh, this singular approach, which has led to neglect. Uh, of these really important areas of social development um, and uh, community development. Uh, and that's really how we found ourselves where we are with multiple challenges that uh, can seem overwhelming. So the one area of common ground um, I think that does exist is on the future of health care. Um, so, you know, when I, when I was giving a response to the 
Premier Higgs's original throne speech, I looked to see what common ground existed among our within our platforms, and the largest area of common ground was healthcare. And so uh, there, and if you look at some of the other platforms, you see lots of commonalities. So there, in terms of the future of healthcare, um, there's quite a bit of common ground. You know, um, and just to make it concrete, um, moving from a, a solitary physician operating by themselves as the gatekeeper to the you know primary, the healthcare system, um, to collaborative practices with allied health professionals, nurse practitioners, physicians, physiotherapists, dietitians, psychologists, so on, um, where you are a patient of that team. And, uh, and it's really easy, you know, if you've got, you can just walk down the hall and meet the other person you're going to have the appointment with next week, or whatever. Um, that, that is more or less, a, I think, a shared vision. Um, but getting there seems to be very challenging. Um, and uh, currently, I think it's because of the upfront capital costs of doing that. Um, and I think some conservatism in uh, some of the existing institutions like the New Brunswick um, Medical Society, perhaps, um, because it's, it's quite transformative change, you know. Um, but as they will tell you, too, um, you know, new docs graduating from medical school, largely who are going into general practice, are quite keen on the idea of working in collaborative practices with a, a whole group of different health professionals um, because no one is working anymore like some of the old docs did with these massive files where they didn't have a life. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, it's, it's not happening anymore. You get one doctor replaced by four, yeah. basically. Yeah. So how do we get there? Well, it's interesting. Um, this is what the health authorities want to do. So. Vitalite and, and Horizon, um, and I know that from meeting with uh, with Horizon. Um, but um, what we've just seen announced is really only a, a piece. It's only kind of a partial version of that with uh, nurse practitioner clinics opening up with uh, six nurse practitioners in Fredericton and, and then another Moncton, Frederick, uh, St. John. Yep. So is that because that's what the Minister of Health thought he could get by the premier that's my hunch mm -hmm. could be wrong um because if you're going to do that why not make them collaborative practices with uh allied health professionals like we've seen in the existing six uh community health centers uh in the province that already exist like the Fredericton downtown community health center and, and other versions of that mm -hmm. that exist around the province under horizon mm -hmm. um they proved extremely successful Patients are extremely happy, um, and it's so easy because you know you see your nurse practitioner one day, and the nurse practitioner says, "Okay, I want you to see so and so next week," and that happens, and it's, it's seamless, yep. seamless. Everyone's there, yep. you know, except for you know super specialized physicians or whatever. But no. but for most things, including including the management of chronic disease, which is a a huge um, a huge um, challenge and in, in, in so many people suffering from chronic disease, multiple chronic diseases in New Brunswick, and we need to manage them well for the well-being of people uh, and f to to avoid the crazy costs that that's that's imposing on the uh, on the healthcare system because of the way the healthcare system is set up, not because of the people, but because the way we're not helping them manage their chronic diseases, they're all ending people are ending up in the ER all the time. Mm -hmm. Which should go back to New Zealand's budget based on wellness. Yeah, exactly. And we're coming up to another budget period. I think yes. there's been announcements, and you know that the consultation process will be going on. With that, will come a certain amount of skepticism that it's a true consultation because you know the books might be in print shop already for the decisions that were made. Um, that's another traditional pattern of behavior that if it was willing to change, um, could really create a very different results for the province. Yeah. Um, any thoughts about this year's upcoming budget and, and things you'd like to see, but know it's going to be another frustrating battle because we're still doing everything the same way we've always done it? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you mentioned budgets because Dieppe, the town of Dieppe, um, um, had a part has a participatory budget process. It's legit. Pretty interesting. Good. 
Um, so, so there's, you know, some shift uh, in that way. Well, uh, I think there's two things. One is people, uh, with regards to the so-called consultation, um, need to know what the constraints are. What are the parameters we're operating in here? You know, is, is it a hundred, excuse me, a surplus of $120 million that you're going to generate regardless? So within, is that the constraint we're operating within here? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's an important thing to know. Um, or, or are we, are we balancing the budget and then, you know, there's $120 million that are, that's in there. Is it in or out? Mm. So, uh, that's a good question. I, I am, uh, I am actually going to be in two weeks launching a tour of the province, uh, to hear from people what they think the budget should set as priorities. Um, and so I'll be traveling the province, uh, I'll be doing, I think eight public meetings and then. Uh, a dozen or more um, more informal cafe, you know, coffee shop gatherings. Um, so the public meetings are in the evening and the, yeah. or on a Saturday when people actually can attend them. Yeah. And then coffee shop uh, gatherings for others. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. And, and, and my commitment on that is to bring, uh, synthesize what I, I hear and bring that to the legislature. And as I always try to do, make people's voices visible from the floor of the legislature and hold that up uh, in the light of day uh, against whatever uh, is, uh, the uh, budget is proposed and and uh, and you know I certainly will try and meet with the finance minister before the budget comes down but mm-hmm. these things get done long ahead of time yep. it also ties to one of the hopes maybe with the four-way minority government is that the side narrative to that is um, New Brunswick would acknowledge 10, 15 years ago that there's no difference between the Red Party and the Blue Party. It doesn't matter who's in power. It's always the same. So that's one narrative. Another narrative is it doesn't matter which of those two are elected because the backroom gang, whoever they may be, tend to influence the conversation the most. So that's a little bit why early on in their conversation I poked a bit about, do you feel any change yet? Do you have any influence yet? Because there's many who would hope that a four-way conversation in the legislature would shift some of that narrative especially now that we're 18 20 months into it and it would tend to show up the most at a budget process you've given us some great examples of where you've you've offered you know uh, amendments and they got integrated or offered amendments and they were completely dismissed but at least there was a bit of a move so that the general public can think just minority governments aren't dysfunctional there takes a while for us to get used to how the wheels are going to turn but at least there's a bit of looseness compared to over here, the backroom gang. It doesn't matter. They're still going to say, here's the policy, here's the practice, which is in part why nothing has changed in New Brunswick. Right. And we've got something different now with the four-way minority government. So does it need another year for it to really kind of so, embody a, a fluidity? And yeah. we, we can get the community-driven stuff because you can surface it in the legislature? Or Dieppe can be one model, and then another, others start to mo- imitate the model or duplicate the model. I think certainly would have more of an opportunity to, to to evolve in that direction. I mean, this it's only been 14 months, and as far as being in the legislature, far less than that. Yes. Um, so, you know, uh, so I do see a shift on the government side, which is interesting. Uh, it, only like just leading up to Christmas, basically. So, so that's interesting. Um, but, you know, if you look at history, um, with the famous Pearson minority governments that everyone points to with brought in Medicare and all of that, that was in the second term. Hmm. Okay. The first Pearson minority government was not very productive because they were trying to operate, you know, in the old way. Yes. (laughs) When they had an election and surprise 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 they were uh, re-elected in a minority situation a second time then the prime minister of the day uh, mr pearson said or thought we've got to do something different if we're going to get anything achieved for the people of this country (laughs) and so that's when things shifted in the second term yeah that's why i say that's why i say uh if if we had proportional representation it forces a shift in the culture to require cooperation in, in, in to make things to get things done, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and we're seeing that work uh, going from our system to that system in New Zealand in the not too distant past. So, 
So it's a real possibility um, if we had a government that was convinced as we are to, to move in that direction. Um, otherwise, I do think you really need to, to have that kind of repeated minority experience um, to have that uh, effect. Hmm. And, um, and, and you have to have a leader, of course, who's willing to seek common ground with the others to uh, get positive things done. Because hmm. Because, you know, there's two ways you can go. You can say if you're the premier and you, this is your agenda and you want to get it done and people are just going to have to, you know, fall in mm -hmm. and that's cooperation. Uh, or look at, you know, what are the real needs of the population and, and where is the common ground exist to, to achieve some, meet some of those needs. Mm -hmm. um, two different approaches. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tried to set up in my throne speech response was here's the common ground as I see it. Let's, let's stand on this ground to put in place real solutions uh, to address real problems p people are facing in the province, um, but anyway, that's that's not how we how it began. Yep, it would be interesting to have a, a large scale show actually on um, what would be the five guiding principles for New Brunswick from 2020 to 2060, to see if there was some because those guiding principles could then in turn start to shift um, policy, or the huge letting go that needs to happen from being in power to being in governance which is a whole other energy, emotion, feeling to why you do it. And for citizens who vote to recognize that they're voting for governance, not for in power, there's a, that often yeah. doesn't get talked about, like the role of the voter in this whole dynamic. And I think that was that was really the demise of the Gallant government. Is, 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 uh, my impression was the premier was so set on being in power, he forgot that actually he was supposed to be providing governance. Um, and that's why his cabinet, um, many of the members didn't, weren't really full cabinet ministers in the way we, we learned about it in school <laughs> in terms of their work. Hmm. Um, some were really figureheads. Um, the difference with this current government is the premier does see he's there to provide governance. Um, and we are seeing that reflected in um, cabinet ministers being by and large fully engaged in their with the responsibilities and moving things forward mm -hmm. so you know I look at Dorothy Shepard Minister of uh, Social Development one simple change she made has made uh, a huge impact on people's lives who are homeless and that was you can use the address of something like the downtown community health center to receive a social assistance check mm -hmm. and before that they couldn't get one mm -hmm. how difficult is that to do mm -hmm. previous government did not do that one before that, which was conservative, did not do that, and uh, and she that's an easy fix for a, a serious problem for a certain particular group of very vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. You can receive social assistance use, if you use the address of the local community health center. How great is that? So you know, uh, that's just an illustration of, of when you allow cabinet ministers to. Um, deliver on their mandate and, and, and troubleshoot with the advice of their staff, the public service, who, you know, surely have tried to move these kinds of ideas forward in the past and have run into us, uh, at best, a ceiling, uh, mm -hmm. or at worst, being told how they're supposed to be doing their job, um, which, you know, depending on the government, both of those things happen in the past. So where if you get ministers who are fully engaged and who value their public servants and, and look to them for their advice and what can we do, and then that excites public servants could say, well, here's some ideas we've had about addressing this, that, and the other thing. And the minister then could decide, well, I, I, why can't we run with that? How come that didn't happen in the past? Well, they can tell her and she'll okay, well, we're going to do it. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, um, it's refreshing to see that happening. Let's weave two other narratives together to see if they want to mesh. One is education, New Brunswick's uh, performance when it comes to education. All of the current um, buzz around French immersion, um, what Minister Cardi thinks he, we should be doing and how that all goes. And then tie that maybe to how New Brunswick, uh, I mean, media always spin things in a certain way. So part of me doesn't even want to say it this way, but, you know, the poorest province. So we're going to get more from the equalization payments because now New Brunswick's dead last, da, 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 like it's a race, rather than it's a way of creating a certain standard of access to uh, quality of life across the country. That part of the equalization payment seems to be lost. 
But there is something to be had about New Brunswick being sort of stuck with its education model. Um, good or bad, it doesn't matter, but there's something that doesn't want to shift to it. Um, and then there's something tied to our overall financial well-being. And then tie that to if we treated 750,000 people like a community like the north of New Brunswick. Can we get our act together under a different model that has a better education system that meets national standards a different way? That then in turn within a 20 year, 25 year period, um, you'd see us shifting out of that economic last place uh, measure. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, our education system is pretty good. That's the first thing. It's pretty good. I don't know why the premier chose to describe it as a disaster, but it's pretty good. You look at it in, the, in comparison with uh, systems and outcomes across the uh, OECD, pretty good. Can I interrupt there just a bit? Somewhere out there, there'll be some in the audience who are from Ontario. And they'll go, but in high school system, uh, what they teach in grade 10 in Ontario is what we teach here in grade 12. Mm. So. One of the challenges for bringing business to New Brunswick that I've heard from my own research is don't want to bring businesses to New Brunswick because the families and the children of the families um, are going to be lost the last two years because the stuff they're doing is stuff they did in grade seven or eight. might not be a measure of performance, but there seems to be a concrete difference. So uh, can we... I haven't heard that, so I don't oh, know. Okay, good. I, I didn't mean to that. catch off then. But, but I mean, certainly we, one thing's clear, because when the 10-year plan was being proposed, I did a lot of chatting with um, constituents and teachers and, and students about what they thought needed to improve. And one was um, resources for what they're trying to do now, mm -hmm. under-resourced. And, um, and so that's, you know, they're... they're, they're, they're um, required to, to deliver in a certain way, but they haven't got the resources to deliver that. So that's a problem right there. There's some other things. Um, right now, uh, teachers are able to teach any subject. Um, the suggestion was made, and it makes sense to me, that uh, teachers should be teaching within their area of expertise. And if they want to teach in another subject area, uh, then they need to do upgrading to do that. So that then you're delivering, so this is now about quality of education that's being provided, so that people who, who, whose uh, educational background in teaching was to teach math are delivering math and not um, chemistry. So um, that, that's kind of key, I think. When, I, when you when your when your student when your child is, is is got a chemistry teacher or a math teacher or an English teacher, the expectation the reasonable expectation should be that those teachers trained and trained as teachers in those specific subjects as their er, 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 subject matter expertise. Um, but that's that's not you know that's not a rigid rule that people move around and teach all kinds of things, and I think if we change that, uh, that would make uh, a good improvement um, you know I, can, I shouldn't use anecdotal but I know for example um, uh, people str struggling in math hit a teacher whose area of expertise was mathematics and suddenly they weren't struggling anymore suddenly they were doing better than average in the class yep. um, so so there's I think there's something very important in, in that um, that discussion about ensuring that teachers teach to their in their areas of expertise. And to play with that theme a bit, because that would poke down to um, another narrative around education is that there's been too much political interference over a 20 year period in the delivery yeah. of the education system. So that teacher being allowed to teach that way and build that relationship and suddenly in a, a breakthrough happens for the student would mean that student, that teacher was left alone for a while yeah. <laughs> to develop that relationship rather than here's the new policy policy coming down the pipe. Oh, three years later, here's the next policy coming down the pipe. Well, and we're seeing that again potentially with the Green Paper um, uh, on education, some of the things in there that will also once again make these kinds of rapid changes. And we saw it with yanking French immersion out of grade one, putting in three, one, grade three, putting it back in grade one. I mean, that's very disruptive, obviously. Uh, so, so um, you know, we've got a good education uh, system for training teachers in New Brunswick and in Canada. Um, we've got 
uh, great teachers. I'm not saying there aren't a few that, you know, mm. uh, could do better, but by and large, we have excellent teachers mm -hmm. so passionate about their students, which is half the battle right there. Uh, and so we need to be able to support them to do what they do best. And uh, I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, that's key. And then when they want to be innovative, the system needs to be flexible enough to enable that. Um, so, so again, it's, it's, it's in a way, how can we support, uh, teachers in doing what they do and, and, and trying things that, uh, they feel would be helpful, um, in the, in their classroom, in their schools, the same goes for the administration of those schools. Um, one thing that factors into this, I think would be is if we, uh, return to smaller school districts where the decision making is made closer to the schools. Um, and the feedback is closer to the administration, then uh, then it would be easier to identify the needs and and uh, and with a willing provincial government meet them. Um, the school districts are way too large now, and so schools are so remote from where the school district offices are in so many cases. Uh, it's 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 a problem. So so we need to re decent recent re decentralize. I don't know <laughs> the the, uh, the system that way. And I think that would be very helpful. It would make it enable more flexibility, and 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 uh, um, that's I always key. Mm -hmm. And feedbacks, yep. feedbacks, because <clears throat> that in turn drives to uh, once you've got um, an educated population, the economic drivers tend to just fall into place. I'm thinking of um, stuff I've read back during the Pierre Trudeau era when recruiting Toyota to come to Canada and set up plants in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And uh, the main hook was we have an educated workforce. And, yes. And, and so once you stabilize that, then Ontario and, and parts of Quebec had that, especially that manufacturing belt that they've got in Ontario. And, and then that spurred, to, you know, besides some legislation about Canadian content or so much built on Canadian soil. But so, I, think, I think the other thing, though, is because is I've talked to people who are, are bailing from the province who came here mm -hmm. from elsewhere um, and I hear this from native born New Brunswickers too. There's no sense of vision for the province. There's no sense of, of, uh, of boldness about where we're going in the future. No sense that we really believe in, in ourselves. And, uh, and they are people just extremely frustrated and they're thinking like, so they're say, we're, we're going to go somewhere else where, where I have a sense of, of moving into the future in, in a, in an exciting way mm. and, uh, and, and not being stuck in, in a rut. That's um, what I mean about the four or five guiding principles. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, I mean, I, uh, that's, that drives me bananas. Uh, when we see, we're not a big province and when we see bright, passionate people, community engaged bailing, not cause they haven't got work, yep. but bailing, you you gotta say something, something fundamentally has to change. In my interview with uh, Nils Riemann in a company he'd created here in New Brunswick called uh, Canuvo, which is CBD-based uh, health products. And uh, he was had his PhD from Ireland, but he's from Scandinavia. Yes, you know, I've met him. Yeah, yeah. And, and his wife, and they lasted three years here. And during his interview as an entrepreneur, business person, his frustration was with uh, the closeness. Um, he of the business community and the government community. So when, when he went looking for collaboration, when he went looking for sharing ideas, um, it was no, 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 because you're going to be a competitor, rather than we all work together to create a culture, and yeah. this lifts the whole province up. Yeah. So he's back in Ireland now, and his business is yeah. doing well. And So that might be a, a concrete example to reinforce what he said. Well, that but, is a good one, yeah. But that said, you've, we've got all this untapped potential for the province. Um, for the, the community-based economic drivers, for an education delivery system that's got a better connection with its grassroots and autonomy for teachers. All of those things are, are there, they're present, but somehow they're still stifled. Is that all legislation? I think um, it's not all legislation, but it's it's leadership and uh, or lack of leadership that, that has trickled down through through the public service. So if you want an innovative public service, you've got to give them oxygen. And the public service is is an essential, obviously, but it's crazy I have to say it, but it's an essential part of 
of uh, of governance and of building, you know, developing the province in the future. <laughs> that we couldn't have gone through what we did in the 60s with Louis Robichaud and the transformations that occurred there, and, and many of them continued by Richard Hatfield, if he hadn't determined that uh, he needed to have a professional public service and, a, and a, an ambitious public service and one that, that was given considerable reign to, to deliver good ideas that then would get acted on. Um, the history of the last couple of decades probably has been miserable that way where public servants are not looked to for their ideas, um, in some cases told what they're supposed to do um, by politicians who don't really know what they're doing um, with respect to, to that particular subject mm -hmm. matter, um, uh, and, and, and living in fear often of retribution for stepping out of line. That's, that's a recipe for what we've got, mm -hmm. right? You've got we've got a tremendous public service, and and it needs to it need, we need to allow the oxygen and light in there to enable it to, to do its work and have politicians who um, are energized by ideas and are not afraid of them, and and then we'll take you know, you know here are two or three different possibilities we can do and here's all the background and backup and all of that we've been working on this right and say. That's a great idea, and I'm going to take that to cabinet, and, and, and we're going to move on it, right? So um, this is so so all the way down the line. If you don't have that kind of sense that your the leadership is looking for you to be part of moving the province in a positive direction, <coughs> um, you're and, and that if you sort of took your neck out a little bit, um, that you might. <coughs> get your head cut off uh, and I don't mean publicly I mean in terms of bringing forward something that's a little innovative or what have you then you're going to get mediocrity and uh, it's uh, um, uh, yeah so that that's really part of the problem there um, if you if you haven't got a public service that is, is that is allowed to work on its all cylinders and and um, encouraged and enthused about their work. I mean, it, used, it was the case in the past where entering the public service was seen as a real um, uh, way to make a contribution to your community or to your province or to your country. Okay. Uh, there's a great um, sound clip from one of the Batman movies to that effect, of all things, <clears throat> when Harvey Dent is talking to Bruce Wayne about public service. And when I watched that ages ago, I thought, oh, that used to be how people talked about working in government. Yeah. And now it's sort of like working for the man who doesn't half the time know what they're doing. Yeah. It must seem like for a lot of people in the public service with very particular expertise and experience. Yeah. So, um, that it's, so it's, it's definitely not simply legislation. We need to, you know, we need policy change and we need legislative change but 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 that relationship needs to hmm. to change and uh, and we've done it before um, you know if you look at our political history we've done great things uh, when the education system was modernized and brought in under Baxter I think and or, or um, uh, was it Baxter anyway um, and uh, and then uh, equal opportunity with uh, with the Roby Show and and uh, the the environmental protection under Hatfield, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting, you know, uh, it was under Richard Hatfield that our environmental protection regime was established. The legislation mm -hmm. was the the core legislation was established. Um, so, you know, you you've got to you've got to have public servants who are uh, challenged to deliver on on novel things like that. Well, it was novel then. Mm -hmm. Right, and that came, that was a that's the other thing. There was a continuum. So, so in the in the dying days of uh, the Louis, turned out to be the dying days of Robichaud's government, um, there was a paper that was written um, for him, which which uh, significantly talked about what needed to be done on environmental protection. And uh, and that was sixty nine, right? So it was kind of in the air, in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially, that was waiting for Hatfield. Who didn't just pick it up, but because of um, citizens 
action, you know, citizen activism and pressure and, and, and public demand for what are we doing about this? Yep. Uh, there was already something that was there waiting for him and his uh, cabinet members to, to build off of. Uh, some excellent thinking and 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 uh, background and all the stuff, so um, so that's that's the other thing you we need to to and this is the role of the public service to help provide that continuum. Uh, so we again so we get away from this um, new government comes in and, and then throws out everything that was underway under the past government. That's happened to our community um, based renewable energy programs. You know it began. Uh, under uh, Sean Graham, um, and they were tossed out under under Allward, and then they were brought back in under um, Gallant, but in a kind of different way. I, I, anyway, it's just right. So so they just moved along at such a, 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 a glacial pace. When you look at Prince Edward Island or Nova Scotia, which have come on like gangbusters with community renewable power tremendous um because because it was a priority of, of those governments in those two provinces uh, and they put in place the necessary um uh, measures to to help make that happen and it's impressive it's impressive at the municipal level mm -hmm. and that's where sometimes change can occur a lot quicker well it can yeah i mean you look at st john energy um, in St. John, so they have a local utility there, and and they real, realized that the whole utility business was changing, and the old model wasn't working anymore, even for them at that scale. So they reimagined themselves, and uh, including to get into generating renewable power um, to supply their system, and they've they've they're doing wind and solar and utility scale energy storage with one uh, the Tesla Tesla company's large utility scale the battery mega packs they call them mm -hmm. first one was built in Australia a few years back and this is the first one in eastern Canada to my knowledge okay. um, so that's vision on the part of the that utility the CEO and his his uh, senior managers um, which is why I encourage the premier to go have a briefing uh so he might get some ideas about maybe where mb power should be headed headed um about two or three minutes left but i didn't want to go the whole show without bringing it up um with the four-way minority government and given that we're all treaty people um can you speak to a larger role for indigenous peoples to have in the decision making process so uh yeah so so this government has had a good idea which is to establish a um, working group of parliamentarians uh, mlas uh chiefs and elders um to uh to pursue that exactly thing that not just decision making but but uh, that is part of um uh, overall uh, building a circle uh, yeah essentially yeah. um and so that supposedly is in the works, and I'm hoping to, uh, I, you know, I, I'm hoping to be a member for our party on that uh, working group. Probably be part of the committee on social policy, but, but um, I guess there's been some hitches in getting it set up. But there's there's a, a, a potentially a great mechanism for beginning that discussion at the political level among politicians and uh, First Nations, um, and then it would be nice to see that move out. Uh, into the communities themselves, and uh, that's so valuable. You, you know, uh, I uh, when when the Select Committee on Climate Change was holding its public hearings, I convinced my colleagues to have a public hearing in uh, a Mi'kmaq community and a public hearing in a Wolastikwe community. And uh, you know, initially their approach was, well, people can just come to the nearby place where we're having it. And I said, no, no. Anyway, I convinced them on <laughs> on going there. Good. And uh, it was, uh, I think, a tremendously rich experience for everyone to uh, meet with uh, grassroots people in the communities to hear their, their thoughts. And we, for the first time, provided simultaneous translation in both of those languages in the two communities. Uh, so it was really groundbreaking. Unfortunately, it didn't get uh, the attention I thought it deserved to uh, indicate that this is a, a way we could go and we can, you know, um, operate. So... So that was that was a, a start, maybe a false start, but I think we can get get uh, get back to that. Final thoughts. Um, 
final thoughts. We're going into the budget, um, and uh, I always think about budgets as uh, as really the blueprint for what government's priorities are and what they intend to do. So that's the framework I think that I encourage people to look at the budget um, uh, with, and uh, most importantly, now that I've were, been working as an MLA for f over five years now, um, it really matters that people when they have a concern, uh, not just write letters, but actually set up meetings and go and visit their MLA to express their concern or their issue or their idea, whatever it is. Um, and I believe that has an impact. I don't see how it cannot at that personal one-on-one -on -one level. Um, you know, this is a representative system of democracy. So people should be meeting with their representatives when they have a great idea they like to see fly or they've got a concern that they feel needs to be addressed set up a meeting use that opportunity i mean i i i i'm, I'm as bad as anyone before i was elected i never met with an mla <laughs> as a constituent ever and never been in an mla's office until yeah. i had one <laughs> so so good things i <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't constrained by any preconceptions of what it should look like, but, but, uh, but I guess I would say that in closing, it's so important in, 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 in our, in our system, it does make a difference. It does have an influence on people's thinking. It has an influence on my thinking, and it certainly has informed, um, considerably what I've brought to the legislature by way of legislation or, uh, or questions or, or, uh, the way I've engaged in debates, um, in addition, of course, to, to what we ran on in the platform. So, so, so it's a nice blend, right? Um, to be to to have your work inform. This is the way it should work. Have your work informed by your constituents, and it helps drive what you do as well as what you campaigned on, which help you know get you elected. So, um, anyway, it's uh, there's nothing but opportunity. Uh, just can't lose uh, uh, lose sight of that. And uh, the the more we believe in our capacity to be our better selves, the better we're going to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other.